for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. Welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson. I'm your host today. Katie Steele and Jack Prince are both off today. Jack is supposed to be in Florida. I don't know if he made it there because of the gasoline shortage up and down the East Coast. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, Katie had some vehicle issues this morning that she needed to get straightened out, so she was unavailable to record. So... I just decided I would do the show by myself today. We've got a lot to cover today. We have an update to the National Rifle Association bankruptcy. I want to talk about the Colonial Pipeline. If I got time, I want to talk about what's happening in Israel with the Palestinians. We have an off-the-cuff segment, and we have a hammer time segment this week. So we've got a lot to cover as I keep repeating. So let's get right to it. Before we get started, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash Southpaws Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at Southpaws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at Southpaws Radio Show.tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube by doing a search for Southpaws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Southpaws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime you like at Spreaker.com or at Stitcher.com. Just do a search for South Paws there. You can find us on Apple Podcasts by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, KZGM in Kabul, Missouri, WOOL in Bellows Falls, Vermont. And we want to welcome back the folks at KEPJ San Antonio, Texas. Thank you for joining us again. And again, a reminder, if you have the time or the money, please donate to your local Pacifica station. They do great work and they can always use your help. We have a couple of corrections that we want to make from last week's episode last week we were talking about michigan state representative brian posthumus who is being accused of drunk driving apparently second offense well we had mentioned that brian posthumus is the son of former michigan lieutenant governor dick posthumus and Jack thought that maybe the posthumous family was involved in the funeral home business, and that is not the case in Mr. Posthumous's case. Uh, Dick Posthumous grew up on a farm. He's been pretty much a lifelong politician, started at a very early age. Another correction from last week, we also talked about Prince Industries and uh, Edgar Prince. Edgar Prince, the founder of Prince Automotive, in Zeeland, Michigan, they had a plant in Holland as well. And Jack had mentioned that they had originally gone into business deboning meat. Well, Prince Industries, based in Georgia, is the company that debones hams and poultry and stuff. They are in no way related to Prince Automotive, which is now Johnson Controls. So I just want to make that correction as well. As a matter of fact, it's too bad that Jack isn't here because one of the original founders of Prince Industries in Georgia, the deboning factory, his name is Jack Prince. <laughs> no relation, I don't think. <laughs> and then the last correction, we were talking about Tecton Woodworks. Katie had mentioned a company, they are the sole contractor for U.S. military bases as far as furniture. And she had mentioned Tecton Tools, which is a Grand Rapids company that former Congressman Justin Amash owns. Tecton Woodworks is a totally separate company from Tecton Tools, and I want to make sure that is clear as well. 
separate ownership. I actually dug into the corporate papers in Oregon. I believe Tecton Woodworks is out of either Oregon or Washington. I forget which one, but I actually dug into the corporate paperwork, and they are indeed two entirely separate owners. So we just want to make sure that that correction is made as well. Well, that takes care of the corrections. Let's get into updates. I want to talk about the National Rifle Association. We had mentioned several weeks ago that they had planned to file for bankruptcy protection so that they could move their headquarters out of New York State and move them to Texas. Well, they've hit a snag, and I have this story. This is by the AFP News Service. This is dated May 11th. A U.S. judge rejected Tuesday a bankruptcy attempt by the National Rifle Association ruling that the gun lobby group filed the petition to dodge a corruption probe in New York. The verdict is a victory for the New York investigation, which seeks to dissolve the powerful conservative organization. Judge Harlan Hale wrote, quote, The court finds that the NRA did not file the bankruptcy petition in good faith because this filing was not for a purpose intended or sanctioned by the bankruptcy code. End of quote. The verdict deals a blow to the NRA, which for decades has been able to shape major political races by endorsing pro-gun candidates. In a statement, the NRA said, quote, Although we are disappointed in some aspects of the decision, there is no change in the overall direction of our association, its programs, or its Second Amendment advocacy. End of quote. The NRA announced in January that it was filing for bankruptcy protection from creditors and moving its headquarters from New York to Texas. The organization and one of its subsidiaries filed petitions for so-called Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in a Dallas court. The NRA said its decision to reincorporate its nonprofit status in Texas would ensure that in the future it is, quote, free from the toxic political environment in New York, end of quote. New York State announced in August of last year that it was suing the NRA and its leader, Wayne LaPierre, for financial fraud and misconduct aiming to dissolve the organization. State Attorney General Letitia James said LaPierre and three other top NRA officials had used the dues and donations of members for years as their personal piggy bank. They spent tens of millions of dollars on themselves and cronies in violation of laws governing nonprofit organizations, according to the New York State Attorney General's office. James, a Democrat, denied she was acting on political motives. She tweeted this following the ruling on Tuesday, quote, The NRA does not get to dictate if and where it will answer for its actions, and our case will continue in New York court, end of quote. So very good news there. Hopefully the New York Attorney General can put a stop to the National Rifle Association once and for all. The next story I want to touch on is the Colonial Pipeline. This is the major pipeline that feeds the east coast of the United States. Well, they had to shut the pipeline down over the weekend because Russian hackers got into the computer system and started messing around with things. So they took the entire pipeline offline, told people, hey, don't panic buy gasoline. So what do people do? They went out and panic bought gasoline. I have seen photos and videos all over the place. People filling up blue 55-gallon plastic drums full of gasoline, hoarding gas, filling up six, seven, two, three-gallon cans, five-gallon cans, whatever. I even saw a picture of somebody filling up clear plastic bags full of gasoline now how are you going to dispense that once you're ready to use that that's what i'd like to know folks this is idiocracy totally idiocracy on several different fronts here first off why are we allowing one huge pipeline to be owned by one company to control that much oil and that much gasoline why do we allow it why hasn't the government broken this up i can tell you why Because the people in the government are probably stockholders in Colonial Pipeline. Number two, why are we allowing computer systems to not have the cybersecurity needed to deny attacks like this? I can tell you why there. It's profit over safety. 
just like the pipeline itself. A lot of you probably don't know, but if you follow Jimmy Dore, the Colonial Pipeline prior to this event had been leaking. One of the worst spills in the nation's history. And you think any news organization has reported on it? None of the corporate media has reported on it. Not ABC, CBS, NBC, Associated Press. Nobody has. Nobody. Why is this pipeline allowed to continue operating? I can tell you why. It's because we have a need for oil. We use it for everything. It's not just gas for the cars, not just to heat your house. All the plastics take petroleum. Your styrofoam containers for your takeout meals, that's petroleum. All your plastics, your Ziploc bags, whatever, petroleum. We have an insatiable demand for petroleum. So why did this Russian outfit shut down the pipeline? Well, they, they didn't shut down. They were in the process of taking over the computers. They, the company shut the pipeline down, or so they say, before more damage took place. And by the way, this company, and I forgot the name of it, <laughs> it had sent a ransom demand, $5 million, and we'll give you the software to fix all these problems. Well, they have a reputation of the software being notoriously slow to fix the problems, number one. Number two, the FBI and the federal government don't like it because they've said we don't want to negotiate with cyber criminals because that just emboldens them. Well, what do you do? You need to take the precautions first. This is national security. And, yeah, President Biden signed an order to beef up cybersecurity among different industries and whatnot. But here's the thing. This won't be the last cyber attack on this country, not by a long shot, because you just proved to them by paying the ransom, hey, crime pays. So anyway, here's one thing. I don't think anybody else has discussed this, but I'll just mention it right here, folks. Because of the group's ties to Russia, let me throw this little theory at you. Again, this is my opinion. Donald Trump has very close ties to Putin. Him and Putin are buddies. How much you want to bet that Trump called Putin and said, Hey, Vlad, I need you to do me a favor. If you want to get me back in in 2024, why don't you have some hackers mess with this pipeline and we can blame it all on Biden? If you don't think that that kind of thing happens, you might want to think again. So, who knows? But anyway... We've got quite a few more stories, and, and again, I hope Jack is able to get gasoline and able to get back to Michigan in a few days. But I want to get to some updates regarding the January 6th treasonous storming of the U.S. Capitol. I have this. This is Ryan Lucas writing for National Public Radio. This is dated May 13th. An active duty officer in the U.S. Marine Corps has been arrested and charged for allegedly assaulting police during the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol by a mob of Trump supporters. Again, this guy is a Marine. Major Christopher Warnagiris was arrested Thursday in Virginia. He has been charged with five counts, including assaulting or impeding an officer, obstruction and unlawful entry. Officials say he is believed to be the first active-duty military service member to be charged in connection with the Capitol insurrection. According to an FBI document filed in federal court, security camera footage from the Capitol on January 6 shows Warnagiris forcing his way through East Rotunda doors. Warnagiris then allegedly tried to prevent U.S. Capitol police officers from shutting the doors and at one point pushed an officer who was trying to secure the entrance. The FBI received a tip from the public in March that helped identify Warnagiris, according to court papers. Agents followed up on the information by obtaining two government photographs of Warnagiris and then interviewing a co-worker at his military command who identified him in photographs from the Capitol. Warnagiris made his initial appearance Thursday in federal court in the Eastern District of Virginia. The government did not seek his detention. Now, why not? I'd say lock him up until... He goes to trial. More than 400 people have been charged so far in connection with the Capitol breach, including around 40 military veterans, as well as a handful of Guard members and reservists. You know what? Those veterans should lose all their benefits. 
you have engaged in treason against your own government that you supposedly took an oath to defend. You don't believe in the Constitution. You don't believe in the red, white, and blue. You believe in Trump. You believe in the orange stain. You believe in a cult. You're a cult follower. You're just as much of a cult as the people who followed Jim Jones in Guyana in the 70s. What's next? Is Trump going to tell you to drink the Kool-Aid and you're just going to blindly do it? That'll be next. Anyway, we got to get to this next story. This is Minya Von Burke writing for NBC News. This is dated May 11th. A second Forest Grove, Oregon police officer was indicted over an incident involving a Black Lives Matter flag. Officer Brady Schutz was taken into custody and charged with first-degree official misconduct over an October 31, 2020 incident involving another officer accused of punching a Black Lives Matter flag that was hanging on Morella Castaneda's garage door. Schutz was booked into jail and released, according to a statement Friday by the Beaverton Police Department, which conducted an investigation into the officer's conduct. Castaneda said in a tort claim against the Forest Grove Police Department that another officer by the name of Teets targeted the family, quote, for harassment because of her political viewpoint, end of quote, after he saw the Black Lives Matter flag outside her home. The Court claim reads this way, quote, Officer Teets terrorized Miss Castaneda and her family and yelled at them to fight. Officer Teets banged on the Black Lives Matter flag and charged Miss Castaneda and kicked her front door in an attempt to enter her home and frightened her young son, end of quote. Castaneda called police but claims that the responding officers denied her, quote, equal protection under the law in substantial part because of Miss Castaneda's political viewpoint and her support of Black Lives Matter, end of quote. Again, that is according to the tort, which is an action taken prior to a lawsuit being filed. The Beaverton police statement said that the call came in for a theft in progress. The first officer who arrived recognized the suspect as an off-duty Forest Grove officer by the name of Stephen Teets. A second officer who arrived, Bradley Schutz, took Teets home instead of arresting him. So here we go. This is Grand Rapids all over again. Oh, the prosecuting attorney, we think he's hammered, so we're going to drive him home. We're not going to give him a breathalyzer. We're not going to draw his blood. We're just going to drive him home. And we're going to call it in on a unrecorded phone line, which thankfully was recorded. Oh, jeez. Another officer reported the incident to their supervisor, according to the statement. Teets was arrested the following day and charged with criminal mischief and disorderly conduct. His case is currently pending trial, according to online court records. Beaverton Police Sergeant Kevin McDonald told the Oregonian that in not arresting Teets, shoots, quote, prevented the investigation from happening, end of quote. Attorneys for Teets and Schutz did not immediately return a request for comment on Tuesday. Hey, that sounds like a good duo name for a rock group, Teets and Schutz. Steve, <laughs> Steve Myers, who is representing Schutz, told the Washington Post that his client was limited in how he handled the situation because the local center where intoxicated people are held had been closed Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the county jail was not housing people charged with misdemeanors, he said. So we're going to blame it on the rehab place closing up. Good God. Schutz believed that taking Teets home was the best course of action, the attorney said. Myers added, quote, it's hard to believe that this grand jury could find probable cause, end of quote. Neither officer could be reached if phone numbers listed for them. The Forest Grove Police Department also could not be reached, but said in a statement posted on its website that an outside law enforcement agency will evaluate if any department policies were violated during the incident. Police Chief Henry Ryman said that the investigation will take place, quote, once the criminal process is complete, end of quote. So they're going to delay justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. Let me just remind you folks of that. According to NBC affiliate KGW of Portland, Teets and Schutz are on administrative leave 
as is the first officer who responded. The first officer was not charged. Why not? This is just behavior that needs to be addressed, not by other police, but by civilian boards. Yes, we've talked about civilian boards, but you need to give them some teeth. And here's how you do it. And I don't know if anybody else is talking about this. Civilian boards should be made up of actual civilians, not retired cops. If you're a retired cop, you're automatically disqualified from a civilian board because you're going to back the blue no matter what. You're going to take care of your homies. But here's the thing. If a civilian board finds misconduct on an officer, they should not only be allowed to, but they should be required to file criminal charges against that officer if they find misconduct. And they would have the final say, district attorney gets no sing in it. If the board says file charges, charges have to be filed. You want to stop this right now? Right there's a first step. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need police. But we need a hell of a lot of other reforms before we can get rid of the cops. One of them being people need to have good jobs. And we keep talking on this show about the minimum wage. And now a lot of companies are starting to figure out if we pay people more, we're going to get people to come work for us. There was an announcement on Thursday that McDonald's, at their, I believe they have over 30,000 company-owned stores. The, the, these are not franchises. They are owned by McDonald's. At those stores, they're going to raise wages 10% across the board. Hey, that's not much of a start, but it's a start. There's going to be strikes at McDonald's across the country demanding a $15 an hour wage. If there's a strike going on in your area by McDonald's employees, do me a favor. Don't stop at McDonald's. Do not cross picket lines. Do not be a scab. Don't do it. You need to be in solidarity with these people who all they want is a living wage so they can afford things like food, rent, utilities, heat, clothes. Just be kind to people. Good God. Speaking of not being kind to people, I'm not very happy with Israel right now. Because Israel, yeah, Hamas is lobbing rockets into Israel. Well, why wouldn't they? They've had their land stolen from them. Sorry, that was Palestine. 1917. Look it up, folks. They had their land stolen from them in the 40s. The land that they occupy keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And soon there won't be any land for them they'll be forced out i'll just say it is this really how christians want to live it says in the bible they, they, they talk about oh but it says in the bible that israel is going to get their land back it also says in the bible to treat your neighbor nice regardless of their religion sodom and gomorrah you know why sodom and gomorrah happened it wasn't because they were engaged in lustful activities no it was because of how the people that lived in Sodom and Gomorrah treated outsiders. They didn't treat their neighbors right. Read, read the Bible. You know, if you want to use the Bible for one thing to justify your awful behavior, then you need to read the whole thing, which I guess that would just justify further all of your behavior. As I keep saying, the Bible, the most violent book ever wrote written by man 2000 years ago to control other men and all women hey convince me otherwise you're not going to do it my mind's made up oh god i gotta get off that topic because i'm gonna really get fired up here something else has got me fired up i have this story this is anthony Izagiri and david eggert writing for the associated press this is dated may 12th this is happening in michigan but you can guarantee it's happening in other states across the country as well. Listen to this out of Lansing. A Michigan Republican known for challenging the results of the 2020 presidential election has turned his attention to those who fact-check the claims and statements of public officials. State Representative Matt Maddock, who is out of Oakland County, this week introduced the Fact-Checker Registration Act, 
which would force journalists and others who perform fact checks to register with the state and insure themselves with a $1 million fidelity bond. This legislation also would fine fact checkers $1,000 each day they don't register. Critics say the legislation, if enacted, would be a clear violation of the First Amendment protections for the press and free speech, and it truly is. It ain't going to go nowhere. Try this, Matt, and watch your ass get sued in court. This Matt Maddock is a real piece of work. Work is not the word I want to use. Take a look at his own Wikipedia page, folks, if you want to get some more details. Better yet, I'll just read portions of it here. Again, this is his Wikipedia page, and it's sourced. On November 18, 2020, Matt Maddock introduced House Resolution Number 324 to impeach Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Why? Because she's a woman. That's the period. End of story. They can justify it every other way they want to. The real root cause is she's a woman, and Republicans don't want women to be in control. Period. End of story. And let me add violent conservative Republicans because you're all violent. Every single goddamn last one of you. Violent. All of you. Yes, even your uncle that you love. If he is a conservative, he is violent. Period. The state Senate Majority Leader and State House Speaker, both Republicans, opposed Maddox's call for impeachment, calling it shameful. The resolution was dead on arrival as the legislature had been adjourned and not expected to take action in a lame duck session. But there's more. Maddox had also written a letter to Vice President Mike Pence with 11 other Michigan legislators urging him to not certify the 2020 election. Vice President Pence replied in a letter to Congress, quote, It is my considered judgment that my oath to support and defend the Constitution constrains me from claiming unilateral authority to determine which electoral votes should be counted and which should not, end of quote. But again, there's more. Speaking of not counting the votes, guess where Maddock and his wife Michonne were on January 6th? If you guessed the Capitol in Washington, ding, 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 you're correct. Maddock and his wife, Michonne, who is a National Advisory Board member of Women for Trump, were present at the Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 rallies, but the video and a picture of her and her husband speaking at that rally is no longer available on her Instagram account. Michonne claimed she had organized 19 buses of people to attend the event. Michonne also texted, quote, as a leader for Republicans in Michigan, I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with Americans that know voter fraud is real. Voters no longer trust the system, and we want people prosecuted. Now is not the time for summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. Now is the time for brave men to do the right thing. We never stop fighting, end of quote. We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with Americans that know that voter fraud is real. There's my thoughts on your voter fraud claims. Unbelievable. Let me continue here. When Matt and Michonne walked to the Ellipse rally on Wednesday, January 6th, they said they couldn't get in and went back to their hotel. She later said the rally, quote, was supposed to be a peaceful event and the people who became a mob and broke the law should be held accountable, end of quote. Yeah, she's saying that because she got caught. Unbelievable, folks. Michonne says she is horrified by the death of the young woman and pray for the healing of our nation. I think she means the traitorous b- that got shot in the Capitol because she was a traitor engaging in traitorous activities. Sorry, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Matt Maddock has also deleted his Twitter account. He has not stated anything publicly since the event, but now he's starting in on this. We need to license these fact checkers. They need to pay a $1 million surety bond, and they if they don't, we're going to find them $1,000 a day. Yeah. This is what happens when you have violent conservatives running things. This is what you get every single time. Every single time. Ask Liz Cheney. 
she'll tell you. And then the the Liz Cheney thing, I want to discuss that for a quick minute here. Yeah, Liz Cheney was voted out this week as the number three Republican in the House. And now they've got a Trump puppet in there. And Liz Cheney is pissed. She says she's going to do everything in her power to stop Trump from running in 2024. We'll see what happens there. We'll see if she even has a seat in Congress in 2022 because the people in her state are supposedly not very happy with her. I'm sure there's a lot that are, but who knows at this point. I think the entire Republican Party is absolutely nuts, cuckoo, touched in the head. They all need to be in a mental institution. You can quote me on that. You're talking to somebody right here that has mental illness. And I'm telling you, these Republicans are off the chain nuts. They need to be locked up and sedated until they calm down. I'm beginning to think that all of society needs to be locked up and chained down. I want to read you a couple of stories here before we get into our Hammer Time segment. This is how things are starting to get. We're seeing the breakdown of society right now, and it's not looking good at all. Here's the first story. This is Brianna Kwasnick writing for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. This is dated May 11th. Listen to this, folks. A Little Rock man who got into an argument over his order at a McDonald's early Tuesday was shot in the finger by an employee, police said. Officers responded to the shooting call just before 3.30 a.m., according to a Little Rock police report. 32-year-old Jesse Rose told officers he got into a fight with an employee at the McDonald's on 8011 Geyer Springs Road. Police said the employee, 39-year-old Willie Holmes of Little Rock, reportedly pulled out a gun and shot the man in his right index finger. Witnesses told officers Rose claimed he didn't receive change from a drive through order. Rose and Holmes reportedly fought outside the restaurant when the shooting happened, according to the report. Rose was transported to Baptist Health Medical Center for treatment. Police say that they spoke to the restaurant's manager. You know what the manager did? He sent the guy home. He sent Holmes home. Why? Because he shot someone. That is a direct quote. So there's, I guess, another reason why an employee can get sent home from McDonald's. Oh, you're not feeling well? I'm sending you home. You just shot somebody's finger? I'm sending you home. God. No arrests have been made at the time of this report. The investigation into the shooting is ongoing. So that's not the only thing. Let's go to Tampa, Florida. This is from television station Channel 10 in Tampa Bay. Listen to this, folks. A customer at a Tampa Dunkin' Donuts has died after an employee punched him in the face for using a racial slur. Tampa Police Department says on May 5th, a 77-year-old man in the drive-thru of a Dunkin' Donuts became, quote, upset due to the lack of service he was receiving, end of quote. Employees at the location asked the man to leave and did not serve him, according to a press release. But officers say instead of driving away, the elderly man parked his car and walked into the store and began arguing with an employee named Corey Pujols. According to Tampa police, the 77-year-old called Pujols a racial slur, which Pujols challenged the man to repeat. Officers say when the customer repeated the slur, Pujols punched him in the face. The hit knocked the elderly man out and caused him to fall and hit his head. Tampa Fire Rescue responded. The customer was taken to the hospital, and he died on May 7th. Pujols has been charged with aggravated manslaughter of an elderly adult. Tampa police say the case remains under investigation. Have we really, truly, as a society, have we lost our frickin' minds? I mean... Really, I think we have. When you are getting into an argument over change, over slow service, is it worth losing a finger? Is it worth losing your life? No, it isn't. The change situation could have been handled so much more calm and easy. It's really simple. When you close down that till, 
whatever time it is, maybe even close it up early. You count the money, you count the sales, and it's got a balance. If it is over by the amount of change that the guy says he's owed, guess what? That's his money. Give it to him. No arguments, just give him the change. There's procedures and paperwork to do this right, folks. If you're angry about service you're getting, leave. Go elsewhere. Don't go to some employee and use a racial slur against him. I'm sorry. My comments are going to be controversial here. The guy that got punched in the face and died, he had it coming. Do not use racial slurs of people. God, we're in 2021. I shouldn't have to get on the radio and tell people, quit using racial slurs. Quit being a jerk. It's simple. Don't do it. Oh. Now And now two lives have been ruined in Tampa over this. The guy that got punched, he's dead. The guy that punched him is probably going to jail because, guess what? They're going to throw the book at him. And the reason why? Because he's a person of color. People of color are not allowed to strike back against racists. Historically, it's never been allowed. And I doubt it'll be allowed this time. I really do. All right, folks, we got to get on to our next segment, but in order to do that, we need to play the appropriate music. Stop! Hammer time! Oh, yeah, it's hammer time. It is time to drop the hammer on the douchebag of the week. We have a repeat winner this week, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. We have this story. This is Rebecca Shaban writing for NBC News out of Washington. This is dated May 13th. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat of California, said Thursday that Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene's decision to scream at Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez outside the House chamber is behavior that may need to be investigated by the House Ethics Committee. Pelosi said at her weekly news conference that the incident, which she called a verbal assault and abuse of the New York Democrat, was reported to her leadership office. Pelosi said, quote, It's so beyond the pale of anything that is in keeping with bringing honor to the House or not bringing dishonor to the House. It's so beyond the pale that you wonder. It probably is a matter for the Ethics Committee. End of quote. Pelosi added this, quote, This is beneath the dignity of a person serving in the Congress of the United States and is a cause for trauma and fear among members, especially on the heels of an insurrection on which the minority in the committee yesterday denied ever happened. End of quote. Pelosi called Green's behavior egregious and said that the House Republican Conference should create some sort of, quote, respectable behavior standard for them. End of quote. She added this, quote, but it could be that this would rise to the level of an ethics complaint. End of quote. And I, I agree. Respectable behavior standard for Republicans. <laughs> for violent conservatives, they don't want ethics. They want control. That's all they want. They want to take control violently. Pelosi's comments come after Green caused a scene outside the House chamber Wednesday when she accosted Ocasio-Cortez. And that is according to a report from the Washington Post. Ocasio-Cortez said the incident shouldn't be about her, but about standing up against attempted bullying. The congresswoman said Thursday, quote, I used to work as a bartender. These are the kinds of people that I threw out of bars all the time. This isn't even about how I feel. It's that I refuse to allow young women, people of color, people who are standing up for what they believe, to see this kind of intimidation attempts by a person who supports white supremacists in our nation's capital. End of quote. Beautiful. Green, the Republican from Georgia who has had prior incidents of accosting and chasing people in public she disagrees with, yelled that the New York Democrat backs groups like Black Lives Matter, calling them terrorists, according to the account in the Washington Post, which was witnessed by two reporters. No, honey, the cops are the terrorists, you ignorant Ooh, the word I want to use. Ocasio-Cortez's office confirmed the Washington Post's account of the incident. A spokeswoman for the New York Congresswoman also said she hoped House Security would address the incident. 
Green denied Pelosi's charge that she screamed at Ocasio Cortez. <laughs> so she denied it, even though there's witnesses to this. Here's what Green said: "Quote, screaming is what people do when rockets are fired at them, like Hamas terrorists are firing into Israel. That's what people do. They scream when that happens." I was talking to AOC saying you need to debate me about the Green New Deal. End of quote. Yeah, I don't think that was the case. I wasn't yelling at her. You really? Yeah. Oh, God. After a detour to complain about Democratic Representative Ilhan Omar and Vice President Kamala Harris, Green said what she wanted from Ocasio-Cortez was bipartisanship. Yeah. Let me just talk about the word bipartisanship here for a minute. You know, when Democrats say bipartisanship, they want to, quote unquote, work with the Republicans and the Democrats need to stop this because the violent conservative Republican definition of bipartisanship is you will do what we say because that's how they are. They all are like this. All of them. Every single last one of them. Green added, quote, so no, she doesn't need to file ethics violations or whatever she's doing. That's reacting like a child. Adults are able to debate policy, end of quote. Oh, you mean like screaming at your fellow congresswoman? That's adult-like too, isn't it? Earlier in the day, Green mocked Ocasio Cortez for supporting police reform and then wanting them to intervene after the incident. Green wrote on Twitter that Ocasio-Cortez supports, quote, defund the police, end of quote, but, quote, wants to call the police for security because she's afraid of debating me about her socialist, end of quote, environmental plan. Green called Ocasio-Cortez a fraud and a hypocrite. No, honey, you need to look in the mirror and call yourself a fraud. I've got worse names for you that I cannot use on these airwaves. Maybe I'll have to do a Lights Out segment about Marjorie Taylor Greene so I can really express how I feel about her. Because it won't be censored. Guaranteed. The incident played out Wednesday night near the House chamber. According to the Washington Post report, Greene yelled twice, quote, hey, Alexandria, end of quote. Greene was then heard shouting after Ocasio-Cortez, quote, you don't care about the American people. Why do you support terrorists and Antifa? End of quote. Antifa. Anti-fascist. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Fascist. Anti-fascist. Anti-Marjorie Taylor Greene. Anti-Donald Trump. Anti-Mike Pence. Anti-fascist. Écoute. A répété, French for listen and repeat, anti-fascist. Ocasio-Cortez ignored Green and walked away. At one point, turned around and threw her hands up in a frustrated way. I tell you what, I'll, I'll be controversial. I wish AOC would have turned around and punched her in the face. Give her a dose of what that 77-year-old racist down in Tampa got. Let's see how Marjorie Taylor opens her mouth after that, huh? A spokeswoman for Ocasio-Cortez, Lauren Hitt, told the Washington Post that Green tried to start an argument, and she, quote, began screaming and called Representative Ocasio-Cortez a terrorist sympathizer, end of quote, when she tried to walk away. Hitt also told the newspaper that she hopes House leadership and the House Sergeant-at-Arms take steps, quote, to make Congress a safe, civil place for all members and staff, end of quote. Referring to the environmental proposal Ocasio-Cortez has made, Green told reporters after the encounter, quote, she's a chicken. She doesn't want to debate the Green New Deal. These members are cowards. They need to defend their legislation to the people. That's pathetic, end of quote. There's another word for you, Marjorie. If you want pathetic, take a look in the mirror. Go take a good look in the mirror. <laughs> you probably can't see anything. <laughs> Green built her political brand in part by engaging in high-profile verbal attacks on people. Before she was in Congress, Green confronted teenage gun control advocate David Hogg outside of the U.S. Capitol. She posted the video of the incident on her social media. 
This was not the first time Green has tried confronting Ocasio-Cortez in person. She recently recounted at an event with fellow bomb thrower Representative Matt Gates, Republican of Florida, at the Villages in Florida, about a similar encounter in April. She says she told Ocasio-Cortez she wanted to debate her about the Green New Deal. Here's what she said, and she also tweeted about it, too. She said, quote, first off, she wasn't very happy to talk to me. I don't understand why. And she said, well, have you even read it? I was like, oh, my goodness. She sounds like my kids did when they were in high school. I said, I've read most of it. She goes, well, if you would read it, then we could talk about debating it. I was like, okay, I think I'll finish the 14 pages, and then we'll debate it, end of quote. Yep, peas in a pod, birds of a feather. Matt Gates, who is in a federal investigation right now, that he might have been playing around with underage girls, paying them money for sex, allegedly, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who can't shut her mouth long enough to hear what somebody else might have to say. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, you are the winner of Douchebag of the Week, and you deserve it rightly. This is the second time, at least, that you've won this award. So, Marjorie, we have this message for you. Don't be a douchebag. You can't help yourself, can you? You were just born a douchebag, and you got bigger the more power you got. I need to get to this story. Folks, we're probably going to go into more detail on it on next week's show because I really want Katie and Jackson put on this. But I have this story This is Tom Shuba and Frank Main writing for the Chicago Sun-Times. This is dated May 12th. The Chicago Police Department started a secretive drone program using off-budget cash to pay for the new technology the Sun-Times has learned. Details of the police department's drone program were included in an email sent last summer by Karen Conway, Director of Police Research and Development. Wait a minute. The Chicago Police Department has an R&D department. Unbelievable. In the email, Conway told other high-ranking police officials that the department's counterterrorism bureau, quote, utilized 1505 funds for a pilot drone program that operates within the parameters of current laws, end of quote. The drones, quote, have been purchased and the electronic and technical support unit, counterterrorism, is in the process of creating a training to start a pilot. Some of the drone uses will be for missing persons, crime scene photos, and terrorist-related issues. The end of quote. By the way, that was written in an email that Conway sent to former Deputy Superintendent Barbara West and Department Risk Manager Michelle Morris on June 12, 2020. So here's the question I'm sure a lot of you have. What's a 1505 fund? Well, here's the answer. The department's 1505 fund is made up of forfeiture proceeds, money and other assets seized in connection to criminal investigations. Let me add that you don't have to be convicted to be subject to a 1505 seizure. They've ch- I think they were going to change the law in Michigan. I don't know how far they got on it. But you could not be guilty, and they're still going to seize your stuff, and they're going to keep it you would have to file a lawsuit against the department to get your stuff back because that's how they've written the laws. By the way, that money is not included in the department's official budget and has reportedly been used in the past to purchase other controversial technology, including stingrays. We've talked about stingrays on this show. Stingray is a device that mimics a cell tower and sends out signals to trick phones into transmitting their locations and other information. Yeah, you can listen in on calls using a Stingray. You can read text messages using Stingrays. Michigan State Police has their own Stingrays. A lot of police departments do. Continuing, a state law went into effect in July 2018 that requires law enforcement agencies to report seizure and forfeiture information to the Illinois State Police. Over the past two years, the department reported taking in seized or awarded assets valued at an estimated $25.9 million. That haul stems from investigations into alleged drug crimes and money laundering. 
but the reports don't give the full scope of the department's take because details about seized vehicles were redacted. The report states that roughly $7.7 million was spent over that period on operating expenses, witness protection, informant fees, and controlled drug buys, as well as travel, meals, conferences, training, and continuing education. The spending is not itemized, but the reports state that operating expenses can cover vehicles, guns, and equipment such as drones. Conway's message about the drone program was among a cache of hacked city emails that were leaked online last month by Distributed Denial of Secrets, a transparency nonprofit likened to WikiLeaks. Other emails show the Chicago Fire Department owns drones worth at least $23,000, though a spokesman claimed on Wednesday that it had not yet earned permission to start a drone program. By the way, in the Chicago Sun-Times article, they have printed the email in its entirety. This is just unbelievable. You need to read this stuff, folks. And again, we would not have known about it had it not been for DDS hacking of the email. Asked about the police department's drone program, a spokesman said it, quote, regularly investigates new technology and strategies, end of quote. Spokesman Don Terry continued, quote, the department considers every tool available when it comes to maintaining public safety and actively searches for innovative opportunities, end of quote. By the way, he did not mention drones specifically in his statement. He adds this, quote, CPD has strict guidelines for all tools and programs to ensure individual privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, and other interests are protected. We also meet with community partners to make certain that all enforcement efforts meet the highest standards and have support among the individuals Chicago police officers are sworn to serve and protect. End of quote. Terry and other spokespeople for the police department and the mayor's office did not respond to specific questions about the emails. Kristen Kabanban, a spokeswoman for the Chicago's Law Department, issued a statement Friday saying city agencies would not answer questions from the media about the contents of the hacked emails. And by the way, the ACLU is irate about this, and rightfully so. Like I said, I want to continue this conversation next week on the show. But once again, Chicago police serving and protecting the hell out of you just as every other law enforcement agency in this country does as well. By the way, one thing that came up in the hacked emails, and has also been reported by the Chicago Sun-Times, that 66% of Chicago Police Department vehicle chases have ended in crashes over the last three years, I believe, including, I believe, eight fatalities as a result of police chases. A lot of departments have now set policy regarding police pursuits and have said, if you start getting into populated areas, you need to lay off. We can find them later. You know what they do in Japan? If you're being chased by the cops, the cops shoot a paint gun at your car. This is paint that is almost impossible to remove. So then they track you down later by looking for your car that's got paint on it. You know what, in this day and age, with all the cameras that are installed on police cruisers that read license plates like you wouldn't believe, there's ways that they can stop these people without engaging in high-speed pursuits. Really, there is. And like I said, we'll continue with this talk about the Chicago Police Department next week and their drone program. Right now, I want to get to Off the Cuff. This is Matthew Galt writing for Vice.com. This is dated May 12th. This is amazing. So this comes out of St. Joseph County, Michigan. There was a hearing recently in front of Judge Jeffrey Middleton in St. Joseph County Court. A man by the name of Nathan Saxon had to respond to drug paraphernalia charges. So they did a Zoom meeting because of COVID and everything else. Well, when Saxon logged in, his screen name popped up as well. 
<laughs> which she did not know that it popped up on the screen. So Judge Middleton said to the assembled Zoom meeting, quote, we'll bring this fool in, end of quote. So they add, add him to the conversation. Middleton said, good morning, sir. What's your name? <laughs> Sexton said, me? Middleton said, yes. He replied, quote, Nathaniel Saxon, sir, end of quote. As a distressed and confused Saxon scanned the crowd, I don't know how much crowd scanning you can do over Zoom, the judge responded, quote, your name's not butt f***er 3000, you yo-ho, end of quote. Uh, the judge pronounced it yo-ho, but we think he meant Yahoo. The judge added, quote, logging into my court with that as your screen name. What kind of idiot logs into court like that? End of quote. Saxon looked horrified. The other people in court were undisturbed. He said, quote, I don't believe I typed anything like that in. End of quote. Middleton said, quote, well, that's what it says. End of quote. He then dumped Saxon into the waiting room. When he returned, Saxon was apologetic. He said, quote, your honor, if I may explain, I think it was whenever I set up my Zoom account or whatever, but um, effer is my iPhone pairing name for my Bluetooth speaker, sir. It's an inside joke. I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. End of quote. The judge responded, quote, well, you should be. End of quote. <laughs> 20 minutes later, Saxon had pled guilty to possession of drug paraphernalia. During a traffic stop, police found a syringe with methamphetamine residue in it in Saxon's truck. He agreed to pay a fine of $200. Middleton told him he was lucky to have escaped the day's events without a contempt of court charge for this screen name. Yeah, I'm sure if he was in Judge Rosemarie Aquilina's court, he'd be sitting in jail for 93 days. Middleton has become a minor celebrity online. He broadcasts his court proceedings to Zoom, where the worst moments in people's lives are picked up and dissected by eager fans. <laughs> Uh, the article from Vice.com ends with the line, at least the guy didn't show up in a cat avatar. <laughs> wow. Folks, always check your connection names, your screen names before you go to court. Really, you should. That's going to wrap things up for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson for Katie Steele, Jack Prince, and Kristen Cook. Please support independent media in the First Amendment. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved. <laughs>